you know, if you take people, and I've told you this, and you expose them voluntarily to things that they are avoiding and are afraid of. You take young people, say they're 16 to 22, and they're not really feeling that good about who they are because their life is chaotic and in disorder and they don't know where they're going. And you know, if you take people, and I've told you this, and you expose them voluntarily to things that they are avoiding and are afraid of, you know, that they know they need to overcome in order to meet their goals, their self-defined goals. If you can teach people to stand up in the face of the things they're afraid of, they get stronger. And you don't know what the upper limits to that are, because you might ask yourself, like, if for 10 years, if you didn't avoid doing what you knew you needed to do, by, the def by your own definitions, right, within the value structure that you've created to the degree that you've done that, what would you be like? Well, you know, there are remarkable people who come into the world from time to time, and there are people who do find out over decades-long periods what they could be like if they were who they were, if they said, if they spoke their being forward. And they get stronger and stronger and stronger, and we don't know the limits to that. We do not know the limits to that. And so you could say, well, in part, perhaps the reason that you're suffering unbearably can be left at your feet, because you're not everything you could be, and you know it. And of course, that's a terrible thing to admit, and it's a terrible thing to consider, but there's real promise in it, right? Because it means that perhaps there's another way that you could look at the world and number, another way that you could act in the world. So what it would reflect back to you would be much better than what it reflects back to you now. I often ask undergraduates, how many hours a day you waste, or how many hours a week you waste? And the classic answer is something like four to six hours a day. You know, inefficient studying, uh, watching things on YouTube that not only do you not want to watch, that you don't even care about, that make you feel horrible about watching after you're done, that's probably four hours right there. You know, you think, well, that's 20, 25 hours a week, it's 100 hours a month, that's two and a half full work weeks, it's half a year of work weeks per year. And if your time is worth $20 an hour, which is a radical underestimate, it's probably more like 50 if you think about it in terms of deferred wages. If you're wasting 20 hours a week, you're wasting $50,000 a year. And you are doing that right now. And it's because you're young, wasting $50,000 a year is a way bigger catastrophe than it would be for me to waste it because I'm not going to last nearly as long. And so if your life isn't everything it could be, you could ask yourself, well, what would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you? You'd be, who knows how much more efficient? 10 times more efficient. 20 times more efficient. That's the Pareto distribution. You have no idea how efficient, efficient people get. It's completely, it's off the charts. Well, and if we all got our act together collectively and stopped making things worse, because that's another thing people do all the time, not only do they not do what they should to make things better, they actively attempt to make things worse because they're spiteful or resentful or arrogant or deceitful or, or homicidal or genocidal or all of those things all bundled together in an absolutely pathological package. If people stopped really, really trying just to make things worse, we have no idea how much better they would get just because of that. One of the things psychologists have done for the last 20 years, especially the social psychologists, is push this idea of self-esteem. You should feel good about yourself. And I think, why would you tell someone 20 that? It's like, you should feel good about who you are. It's like, no, you shouldn't. Why should you feel good about who you are? It's like, you should feel good about who you could be. I'm not saying that people shouldn't have confidence, but like often you take young people, say they're 16 to 22, and they're not really feeling that good about who they are because their life is chaotic and in disorder and they don't know where they're going and they don't know which way is up. But the thing is, it, it has to be stated with precision. It's like yeah. you should treat yourself as if you're valuable, especially in yes. potential. But you should concentrate on who you should become, especially if you're young. And so let's say you're miserable and nihilistic and chaotic and depressed and all of that now, and you have your reasons, you know, terrible parenting, abuse, all of those things. It's like, well, you should feel good about yourself. It's like, no, no, it's, n it's, not, it's not the right message. Is that it's more like you should understand how much potential there is within you to set that straight. And then you should do everything you can to manifest that in the world, and it will set it straight. And that's better than self-esteem. It's like, you're, you're in a crooked, horrible position. Okay, fine. There's a lot of suffering and pain associated with that. Yeah, you can't just feel good about that because it's not good. But you can do something about it. You can genuinely do something about it. And I think all the evidence suggests that that's the case. So I'm telling, telling young people, look, there's 
no matter how bad your situation is. I'm not going to pretend it's okay. It's not okay. It's tragic, tainted with malevolence. And some people really get hurt by malevolent people, like, you know, terribly hurt. Sometimes they never recover. It's really awful. But there's more to you than you think. And if you stand up and face it with, with a positive, with a, with a noble vision, with discipline and intent, you can go far farther to overcoming it than you can imagine. And that's the principle upon which you should predicate your behavior. And I think that one of the things that's really nice about being a clinical psychologist is that this isn't just guesswork. Like one of the things, we know two things in clinical psychology. One is truthful conversations redeem people. Because if you come to a clinical psychologist whose worth is salt, you have a truthful conversation. The conversation is, well, here's what's wrong with my life. And here's what caused it. You know, maybe it takes a year to have that conversation. And both of the participants are doing everything they can to lay it out properly. Here's how it might be fixed. Here's what a, a beneficial future might look like. And so it's a completely honest conversation if it's working well. And all that's happening in the conversation is that the two people involved are trying to make things better. That's the goal. Let's see if we can have a conversation that will make things better. Okay, so we know that works. It does make things better. And then another thing we know is that, well, let's say there's a bunch of things that you're afraid of that are in your way. So you have some vision about who you want to be. Maybe you have to, you know, you want to be successful in your career, so you have to learn to talk in front of a group. It's like, okay, well, you're afraid of that. It's like, no wonder you don't want to be humiliated. So, okay, so what do we do about that? Well, maybe we first get you to speak in front of one person and then three people, you know, for five minutes and then for ten minutes. Like, graduated exposure to what you're afraid of. Voluntary graduated exposure to what you're afraid of is curative. And that's true. It works. The documentation is in. It's how people learn. So, so to, to, to tell people that if you confront the world forthrightly, if you speak the truth, and you expose yourself courageously to those things that you're afraid of, that your life will improve, and so will the life of people around you. Like, as far as I'm concerned, that's as close to undeniable fact as we've, as we've got. And it also dovetails nicely with the underlying archetypal stories, the heroic stories. It's like, go out there, find the dragon, confront it. It's a dragon, it might eat you, it's dangerous. But it's worse to cower at home and wait for it to come and devour you. Go out there, confront it, get the gold, share it with the community. It's like, yeah, it's the oldest story of mankind. What could you do to improve yourself? Well, let, let's step one step backwards. The first question might be, why should you even bother improving yourself? And I think the answer to that is something like, so you don't suffer any more stupidly than you have to. And maybe so others don't have to either. It's something like that. You know, like there's a real injunction at the bottom of it. It's not some casual self-help doctrine. It's that if you don't organize yourself properly, You'll pay for it, and in a big way, and so will the people around you. Now, and you could say, well, I don't care about that, but that's actually not true. You actually do care about that, because if you're in pain, you will care about it. And so you do care about it, even if it's just that negative way, you know. Um, it's very rare that you can find someone who's in excruciating pain who would ever say, well, it would be no better if I was out of this. It's sort of pain is one of those things that brings the idea that it would be better if it didn't exist along with it. It's incontrovertible. So you get your act together so that there isn't any more stupid pain around you than necessary. Well, so then the question might be, well, how would you go about getting your act together? And the answer to that, and this is a phenomenological idea too, it's something like, look around for something that bothers you and see if you can fix it. So now you think, well, let's say, there, let's say you go into a, you can do this in a room. It's quite fun to do it just when you're sitting in a room, like a room, maybe your bedroom. You can sit there and just sort of meditate on it and think, okay, if I wanted to spend 10 minutes making this room better, what would I have to do? And you have to ask yourself that, right? It's not a command. It's like a genuine question. And things will pop out in the room that you know, you like there's a stack of papers over there that's kind of bugging you, and you know that maybe little order there would be a good thing. And, you know, you haven't... There's some rubbish behind your computer monitor that you haven't attended to for like six months and the room would be slightly better if it was a little less dusty and the cables weren't all tangled up the same way. And like if you, if you allow yourself just to co consider the expanse in which you exist at that moment, there'll be all sorts of things that'll pop out in it that you could just fix. And you know, I might say, well, if you were coming to see me for psychotherapy, 
the easiest thing for us to do first would just be to get you to organize your room. You think, well, is that psychotherapy? And the answer is, well, it depends on how you conceive the limits of your being. And I would say, start where you can start. You know, if, if something announces itself to you, which is a strange way of thinking about it, as in need of repair, that you could repair, then, hey, fix it. You fix a hundred things like that, your life will be a lot different. Now, I often tell people, too, fix the things you repeat every day, because people tend to think of those as trivial, right? You get up, you brush your teeth, you, do, you have your breakfast, you know, you, you have your routines that you go through every day. Well, th those probably constitute 50% of your life. And people think, well, they're mundane, I don't need to pay attention to them. It's like, no, no, that's exactly wrong. The things you do every day, those are the most important things you do, hands down. All you have to do is do the arithmetic. You figure it out right away. So, a hundred adjustments to your broader domain of being, and there's a lot less rubbish and there's a lot less rubbish around and a lot fewer traps for you to step into. And so, that's in keeping with Jung's idea about erasing the dis once you've got your mind and your emotions together, and once you're acting that out, then you can extend what you're willing to consider yourself and start fixing up the things that are part of your broader extent. Now, sometimes you don't know how to do that. So you might say, imagine you're walking down Bloor Street and there's this guy who's like alcoholic and schizophrenic and has been on the streets for 10 years. He sort of stumbled towards you and, you know, incoherently mutters something. That's a problem. And it would be good if you could fix it, but you haven't got a clue about how to fix that. You just walk around that and go find something that you could fix because if you muck about in that, not only is it unlikely that you'll help that person, it's very likely that you'll get hurt yourself. So, you know, just because while you're experiencing things announce themselves as in need of repair, doesn't mean that it's you right then and there that should repair them. You have to have some humility. You know, you don't walk up to a helicopter that isn't working and just start tinkering away with it. You, you have to stay within your domain of competence. But most of the time, if people look at their lives, you know, it's a very interesting thing to do. Uh, I, like the, I like the idea of the room because you can do that at the drop of a hat. You know, you go back to where you live and sit down and think, okay, I'm going to make this place better for half an hour. What should I do? And, and you have to ask and things will just pop up like mad. And it's partly because your mind is a very strange thing. As soon as you give it a name, a genuine aim, it'll reconfigure the world in keeping with that aim. That, that's actually how you see to begin with. And so if you set it a task, especially, you have to be genuine about it, which is why you have to bring your thoughts and emotions together, and then you have to get them in your body so you're acting consistently. You have to be genuine about the aim, but once you aim, the world will reconfigure itself around that aim, which is very strange. And, and it, it's, it's, it's technically true. You know, the best example of that, you have all seen this video where you watch the basketballs being tossed back and forth between members of the white team versus the black team. And while you're doing that, a gorilla walks up into the middle of the video and you don't see it. It's like, you know, if you thought about that experiment for about five years, that would be about the right amount of time to spend thinking about it. Because what it shows you is that you see what you aim at. And that man, if you can get one thing through your head in as a consequence of even being in university, that would be a good one. You see what you aim at. And so because one inference you might draw from that is, be careful what you aim at, right? It, what you aim at determines the way the world manifests itself to you. And so if the world is manifesting itself in a very negative way, one thing to ask is, are you aiming at the right thing? I read the, the story it's not a biography, if I remember correctly, of the, of the captain. I might be wrong about that, but I've got the basic story, right? Well, they had a shipwreck in the Antarctica. It was, and then they were there for a whole year in the Antarctica, you know? And none of them died. Not one. He didn't lose a single man. Not one. He kept the morale high. And then they took this boat that was on the ship, and they crossed like 400 miles of the roughest ocean, the roughest frigid ocean in the world, right? You don't go in that ocean. And then they went to an island... And they walked across the island, across these mountains that no one else has ever climbed since. 
and they went to the city on the other side of the island, and they got a boat, and they went and rescued their compatriots, and everyone survived. It's like endurance is the name of the book. You read that book, man, you think, wow, people are really tough. You know, and, if it, and it's, it's ridiculous. So who knows how tough you are? And maybe you find out by going out to find out how tough you are, right? So you take on a challenge, one that you think you can master. Just, it's just a bit beyond your grasp. And you master it, and then you're a little tougher, and you think, hey, that worked out pretty well. And so then you're more of a monster. And then you go out and you find another challenge that's even bigger, and you think, well, maybe I can do that too. And then all of a sudden you can, and you get a little bit bigger, and God only knows what the limit is of you. And you find out by pushing yourself against the world. Well, let's talk about friendships for a minute. Here's how you know if someone's your friend. A, you can tell them bad news. And they'll listen. And they won't tell you why, you know, you're stupid and, and why that bad thing happened to you and how something worse happened to them once and, you know, derail the whole conversation. You can actually tell them bad news and they'll listen. So that's a good thing. And then, this is a weirder thing, you can tell them good news and they'll help you celebrate. And that's a really good way of deciding who you should have around you. Because if you have someone around you, you know, something good happens to you and you're kind of afraid to even admit it because, you know, God, something good happened to you. It's like, that, you let that be known and it'll certainly be taken away. So, you know, you, you come out and you sort of tell someone half-heartedly that something good happened to you. They, they give you a whack and then talk about, you know, so the great thing that happened to them three years ago. Or worse, the great thing that happened to someone that they knew three years ago. You know, it's like... Go away from that person. They're not helpful to you. And they're not helpful to themselves either. And so you want to surround yourself. You've got to think about this. You've got to surround yourself with people who want the best for the best part of you. You can hang around with weasels and losers that are trying to pull you down to justify the fact that they're spiraling downhill as well. And you know, the upside of that is you don't have to have any responsibility and you can all whine about how wretched life is, you know, so that's pretty attractive. But I would say it's also a me bad medium to long-term plan. And so it's, it's acceptable and desirable to try to surround yourself with people who are facilitating your development. You know, and you might say, well, I've got people around, I know them well, you know, they're, they're, they're not doing that well and, and they're, and, and they don't fit into that category. It's like, what's your point? What are you going to do with them exactly? If they'll, if they'll listen and cooperate with you and move towards a better future, great. If they don't pay any attention and they keep doing the same damn things over and over and they're not going anywhere and it's painful, then maybe the proper thing to do is say, you just have your misery. I'll go off and have my life. And maybe you'll wake up at some point in the future and think that's a better way of being. Because just putting up with it is, all, well, they call that enabling, right? You put up with that sort of behavior, you're providing tacit consent for it and even tacit approval. It's like, it's a bad idea. You have, I would say, both the right and the responsibility to surround yourself with people who are good for the best part of you. When I had talked to people about doing the future authoring program, they often put it off. And it's not surprising because it's hard. And, and be it, but it's more than that. They think, well, I don't know how to write. I'm going to do a bad job. I don't really like assignments. I'm going to have to do it perfectly. I need to wait till I have enough time. And like one of those is enough to stop you cold, and all five of them, you're just done. And so I tell people, do it haphazardly, a tiny bit at a time, and badly. Because you can do that. I tell my students when they're doing their thesis, master's thesis, write a really bad first draft. And then we have a little conversation about that because they don't think I mean that. Because it sounds like a cliché in some sense. It's not a cliché. It's not a cliché at all. It means you're a terrible writer, but, but if someone put a gun to your head and said, you have to have your 100-page thesis done by next Monday or I'll shoot you, but I don't care how terrible it is, you would sit down and write it. And the thing is, then you have it, right? Then, then you have something, and then you can fix it. You can iterate and fix it. That bad first draft, that's the most valuable thing, and so that's what you need. You need a bad first draft of yourself. And there's, there's an idea that Jung developed about the trickster and the jester, the comedian, right? That the, the trickster is the precursor to the savior. That's one of the things I learned from Jung that was just... It's so unlikely. You'd never think that. It's so amazing that that might be the case, but... The, 
the, the, the, the, sat, the satirical and the ironic and the, and the troublemaker, the, the comedian, the fool. The fool is the precursor to the Savior. Why? Because you're a fool when you start something new. And so if you're not willing to be a fool, then you'll never start anything new. And if you never start anything new, then you won't develop. And so the willingness to be a fool is the precursor to transformation. And that's the same as humility. And so if you're going to write your destiny, you can do a bad first job. You're going to get smarter as you move forward. That's the thing, is that, so something beckons to you. That's what happens here. Maybe the star that Geppetto wished on was the wrong damn star, but at least it was a star, right? At least it was in the sky. At least it moved him forward. And so you say in your life, well, something grips you and, and, and fills you with interest. And you think, well, should I do that? And the answer is, if not that, then something. What if it's a mistake? It's a mistake. Rest assured. What do you know? You're going to stumble around, right? And what's going to happen is this. You're going to move. To, you're going to not stay in stasis. You're not going to wander around in circles. And I see people like that. They said, well, I never knew what to do, and now I'm 40. It's like, that's not so good. That's not so good. And you might say, well, and there is a literature, too, that suggests that people are a lot more unhappy when they look back in their lives about the things they didn't do than they are about the mistakes they made while they were doing things. And so that's really worth thinking about too because there's redemptive mistakes. And a redemptive mistake would be a mistake that you make when you go out and try to do something. You know, you actually, you think, okay, I'm going to try to do this. And you're not good at it. You make a bunch of mistakes. It's like, well, what, what's the consequence if you pay attention? Is You're not quite so stupid anymore. That's the thing is you've been informed by, your, by the results of your errors. And so what happens is, you, you, you follow the beacon, you follow the light, and, and you're blind, so you don't know where the light is. It's, it's dimly apprehended only, and you're afraid to follow it, but you decide to take some stumbling steps towards it. And as you take stumbling steps towards it, you become illuminated and enlightened and informed because of the nature of your experience, because you're pushing yourself beyond where you are, and you're going into the country that you have not yet been in, and you learn something. And so what happens then is the star moves. You move 10 feet towards it, and you think, no, that's not right. I didn't get it right. It isn't there. It's actually there. And so then you, you see it somewhere else, and you shift yourself slightly, and you move forward. And that's what happens, is that you continue as you change. The thing that guides you forward moves, right? It's like God in the, in the, in the desert in Egypt, the pillar of light that you're following. It's moving. It's not a permanent thing. You move towards it, it moves away, it guides you forward. And so you say, well, is what I'm aiming at paradise itself? And the answer to that is no, because what do you know? You, you couldn't see paradise if it was right in front of you, but you might get a glimmer of it. And so you move towards it and you grow. And then the next time you open your eyes, you see a little bit more clearly. And that's what happens, is that just happens over and over, right? It keeps moving. And so you move like this. But the thing that's so cool is that all those zigs and zags, you say, and each of those zags is a, and zigs is a catastrophe. I hit a wall, my God, and then I had to die a little bit, and I barely got back up. It's a phoenix transformation at each, at each turn, and it's painful. But the thing is, is that even though you've, you've traveled 20 miles, let's say, on that road, and you've only moved three miles forward, you've moved three miles forward instead of falling backwards, because that's the thing too, is that if you stand still, you fall backwards. You cannot stand still, because the world moves away from you if you stand still. And there's no stasis, there's only backwards. And so if you're not moving backward, back forwards, then you're moving backwards. And that's more, more of the underlying truth of, of the Matthew principle. To those who have everything, more will be given. From those who have nothing, everything will be taken. It's a warning. Do not stay in one place. Well, as you zig and zag, maybe the, maybe the cataclysm of each transformation starts to lessen. There's not so much of you that has to die with every mistake. And maybe you end up oriented at least reasonably properly. And if you were sensible, that would have been 
your trip. But it wasn't, right? It's that. And perhaps it's a lot worse than that. Perhaps there's no shortage of backtracking. But it doesn't matter because as you stumble forward, you, you illuminate and inform yourself. And perhaps that's partly because the world is made of information. And if you encounter it and tangle with it, then it informs you. And then you become informed. And then you're information. And then you're ready.